Good morning, everyone. We'll give folks just another minute to log on. But thank you to everybody who signed up for today. Uh, my name is attorney Allison Poirier. I'm an attorney here in our estate planning and probate administration department. Um, and I just have so enjoyed putting on these webinars thus far on various estate planning topics. Uh, today's topic is going to be estate planning for farmers. Um, but we also have a very interesting webinar coming up next week, or I should say in two weeks as well, which is going to be tax implications of receiving an inheritance. So I know that's a question I get all the time from um, people when we're assisting them in settling an estate or even in the estate planning phase of, am I going to have to pay any taxes? Are my beneficiaries going to have to pay any taxes? So I think that's going to be a really interesting webinar. Um, and again, that's coming up in two weeks. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, today is estate planning for farmers, which farmers are not a whole lot different from everybody else. Estate planning is important, um, and the end result sometimes can be similar to uh, an estate plan set up for someone who doesn't work in agriculture. But a lot of times they're very specific issues that need to be addressed. So that's why the planning stage, um, at least in terms of uh, thinking about different issues that might come up is so important because it may not be as simple as just, I need a will. So the initial question, anytime I'm speaking with agricultural clients and they're talking about preparing an estate plan is one, I should say the, that initial question is, is the farm going to continue after you're no longer able to run it or after you've passed? So that's the big question. So I know a lot of, I, I've yet to meet a farmer who says, I don't want the land to continue in agriculture. Um, usually there's very strong ties to the land, very strong opinions about what they'd like to happen or see happen with the land and with the farm going forward. Um, but you know, you gotta cross that initial hurdle or get over that initial hurdle. Usually is the farm financially viable? Is this something that you're gonna be able to pass on to the next generation or to your successor? Um, and so, and actually, are you going to be able to find someone who wants to take it on? Um, and again, that financial viability is really the determining factor a lot of times when answering that question. So really consider the income that the farm is producing versus debt obligations, um, so mortgage and other loans and, and such that you may have on the books, running those numbers to see if it makes sense for the farm to continue. Um, also considering the amount of money that you, as you know, what we I typically call the senior generation, is going to need in retirement. Are you expecting, if you sell this property or gift it to the kids, do you still need some kind of income stream? Or do you need to see a really big realization of assets upon the sale of the business just to fund your own retirement? Um, so again, definitely need to consider that as a secondary factor. Um, and as a tertiary factor, uh, the, your successors, the next generation that's taking over, uh, what amount of money are they going to need to continue their lifestyle and to continue to run the farm? So again, all things that really need to be taken into consideration when determining um, who gets the farm, yes, but initially, again, the first hurdle is, is it financially viable? Is anybody going to want it? Um, and then again, in terms of the, the bigger question of who gets the farm, um, do you have family members that are going to be willing to take it over? Are there children that have been already working on the form of the farm, or at least maybe expressed an interest in taking it over, um, or even grandchildren, maybe again in that same role that have either already are already involved in farm operations or have uh, an expressed an interest in, in being involved? And if not, is there a, a key employee maybe who be, might be willing to take it over, or even just? selling to an unrelated or uh, an unknown third party and, and just, again, transferring all those assets over and having them continue on. Um, and then also too, it's considering, I say who gets the farm, but then it's also too considering, well, what is the farm? If this is something we're talking about transferring it, is it really just the transfer of the farm business? So it is a transfer of the cows and the tractors and equipment, or is it a transfer of the underlying real estate? So also a key distinction there in terms of when we're saying we want so-and-so to get the farm, well, what exactly do we mean when we say the farm? So 
after you kind of figured out those initial questions, so is the farm viable? And then is there someone in place to take over or to sell to? Um, the next big question is to make sure that those wishes are then um, either articulated in their in estate plan or any business documents, so LLC operating agreements or corporate documents that you have, um, line up with your estate plan. Uh, so many times I see folks with um, a simple will or a trust that says, when I die, it all goes to my spouse, or when we're both gone, it all goes to the kids in equal shares, which a lot of times works out just fine. Um, but in farm situations can be make a, the situation pretty complicated, particularly when maybe there's only, in the instance where you have children and only one child is the heir apparent that's really going to be taking over the farm. If your will or your trust or your estate planning documents say, I leave everything to the kids in equal shares, well, now the farm hasn't gone to that one heir apparent child. It's going to all three. And what if the other two non-farm kids say, well, I want my inheritance now. Let's just sell it all and be done with it. That can create a really big financial problem for the farm child because they're now put in the position of having to either come up with the funds to buy out their siblings or potentially seeing the farm be sold to someone else and go by the wayside. Um, so th that's why it's so important to, if you have existing documents in place, really taking a look at them, really thinking about the assets that you're going to own when you pass. So seeing how those instructions that you've outlined in your will or your trust is what it's really going to mean, practically speaking, in terms of how your assets are going to be distributed. So if you do have an older will and you see it says, again, all to the kids in equal shares, but you know it's really supposed to just go to one of the children, for example, then you should really update your documents to say, well, the farm and the real estate, or again, whichever, however you define the farm, that goes to the farm child, and maybe the balance goes to the, the, all, all the kids in equal shares, or maybe the balance goes to the other kids that are not receiving the farm. So again, kind of just rethinking those distribution provisions and updating them as necessary. Um, also to, again, I, and I can't really stress this enough is be clear too when you say the farm, is it the equipment? Is it the cows? Is it the greenhouses? Or really, is it just, um, the real estate you really have to make that distinction because in the eyes of the law, there, those are really separate assets. Um, so just be very clear and not only, um, who is going to get the assets, but particularly exactly which assets they're going to get. Also important to think about, even if it's you've chosen that child, you've chosen that grandchild, you've chosen that heir apparent to take over the farm. In my line of work, we always recommend alternates. God forbid something happens to a child where they pass away during your lifetime. Who's going to get it in that in that instance? Is it their kids if they have any? If that um, if they're not or if the heir apparent child, the farm child isn't a bill, uh, isn't alive to take over the farm. Um, maybe in that case, the other two, for now, non-farm children feel differently. Maybe they're okay then with taking on the farm. Or maybe then everybody just accepts that if that one person or the persons aren't available to take on the farm, maybe it is just the assets, the real estate is all sold and distributed. So thinking ahead, not only of your primary choice, but thinking of alternates um, in the event of some contingencies. And also too, as I mentioned, so you may have wills in place or trusts in place you did previously that have distribution instructions that now don't make sense and you need to update. And also keep that in mind, that should be kind of a rolling review. Every few years, read through the will and the trust, re make sure um, the documents still say what you want them to say, because the farm child who's agreed to take over the farm now um, may change their mind later, or maybe one of the other children say, well, now I do want to be involved. So again, your, your documents should continue to be updated to reflect the current state of things. So if you get past those initial questions and you find the person that you want to take over the farm, and just in my example, I'm primarily um, going to use just a child as the, the example of the heir apparent. So you found your farm child that's willing to take over the farm. Um, you know you want them to carry it on. So now it's how do we effectuate that transfer to them? So kind of encompassing, encompassed within the estate plan is also the farm succession plan. Uh, how do you get those assets over to that farm child? And one tool that I've seen be very useful is the use of LLCs. So rather than just I transfer the tractor to Johnny and the, the cows and the, you know, the plants and the seeds and 
whatever it might be, maybe all those assets, so the business assets, as I mentioned, the, the tractors and the cows or the seeds or the, the actual assets and equipment that you have, those are transferred into a, the farm LLC, or what I sometimes call the business LLC. And so that way, when you're transferring that to the child, to the heir apparent, you're not necessarily having to transfer each individual asset, you're transferring ownership interest in the LLC. So that can be an easier way to effectuate that transition. Um, and also it's gonna provide some liability protection. So if you have uh, farm workers who get injured on the job or, or someone else who you know, is, eats some produce that you produced and gets sick and sues you, um, the, the LLC is gonna provide a degree of liability protection as well. So not only facilitating the transfer to those who are taking over the farm, but again, protection for you and protection for them going forward. Um, so that's, it's typically set up again, as I mentioned, so one LLC for the assets of the farm, and then there's a secondary LLC for the land. You, it tends to make sense to separate them out. Um, again, for liability purposes, you want to shield maybe the real estate from any liability incurred, in, uh, incurred on the business and vice versa. Um, and also intentions for the long-term goals of real estate may be different from the, your long-term intentions for the farm. So as I and now, and I, I've sound a, a bit like a broken record, but again, recognizing there's a difference between maybe who you want to get the assets and who you want to get the land, um, because what I've a, a setup that I've seen that's fairly common is the farm child will get um, some or all of the ownership of the LLC that has the business interests in the assets. And maybe it's the non-farm kids that get the, or at least some or all of the ownership in the real estate LLC. So that's another way to maybe equalize things. So it's not, you're disinheriting the non-farm kids. They're still gonna get something. Um, and again, by putting it in an LLC, it's an easier way to transition um, that asset over to those folks rather than doing a new deed every year saying, I give all the kids a 1% interest in, in real estate this year. And the next year I give them another 1% interest in real estate. That can be cumbersome, it can be expensive simply in terms of reporting fees with the town. Um, so again, by having real estate in the LLC can be an easier way to effectuate that transition. And also by divvying up the, the two LLCs, so with the farm LLC and with the real estate LLC, uh, the farm typically still needs the real estate and just in the operation of the farm. So what happens, again, in a typical situation is that the land LLC leases the real estate back to the farm LLC, so it can actually generate an income stream. So to the point I made where maybe the non-farm kids, you still want to leave them some form of inheritance, um, but you really don't have much other than the real estate and just the, the business assets. So if the business assets and the farm itself goes to the non-farm child, you can set up that lease where now the farm child who owns the, the, LLC, the business LLC, that business LLC is now paying um, annual or monthly or quarterly or however often it is that you want to structure that rental payments to the land LLC. Um, to provide some income stream for the, the owners of the land LLC. So it can be a way to kind of, again, ensure those other beneficiaries are still receiving some form of inheritance, some kind of income stream. And it can also be an income stream for you. So if you kind of hand over the day-to-day -day operation of the farm to your successor, but as I mentioned, in your retirement, you probably still need some form of income stream to pay for your bills. Um, so maybe that's one way to do it is you retain partial, you transfer the ownership of the farm LLC but retain at least a partial interest in the real estate LLC to get some of that income stream every month. Um, and one of the interesting things with LLCs too is you don't necessarily have to be an owner of an LLC membership interest to retain some rights as to the LLC. And to clarify that point, what I mean is that you can be a manager of an LLC um, and still have rights potentially to distributions um, from the LLC or to a salary for serving in the role as a manager. So again, if the goal is really to get assets out of your hand, transition those assets to the next generation, but you still wanna maybe be involved a little bit in terms of how the property is managed, still have a say in that, make sure the property is not sold, still retain maybe a right to an income stream in terms of a salary for the services you're providing as manager. Um, you can still transfer ownership interest in the LLC to the kids or to that next generation. But again, by making yourself self still the manager of the LLC, you retain all those other rights as well. 
Uh, and the last, one of the big questions that always comes up when talking about farm succession and estate planning with, with farmers involved um, is equity versus equality. So, I, and I've talked about this a lot in kind of different, a couple different angles already, but if the majority of your assets is really the farm and it's going all to one child to the exclusion of the others, uh, the non-farm kids may look at that and say, hey, mom and dad left me with nothing. They cut me out. Um, and that may not be the result you want. Um, then again, the non-farm kids could be okay with it and might realize, yeah, you know, Johnny is going to be running the farm. So yeah, he deserves all of it. And we get it. But you need to really think through that in terms of uh, not that your children's or again, that the beneficiary's reaction should entirely dictate what you do, but you should definitely consider um, whether you are okay with it. Are you okay with, you know, some kids getting nothing while one kid maybe gets the lion's share? Um, because that may be the result. If, if all your assets are really the farm, the other kids may not end up with much. That being said, maybe you do have some other assets that are not related to the farm. Maybe you have some retirement accounts or investment accounts. Um, and if so, maybe it's those assets that are those cash accounts that are passing to the beneficiaries, the non-farm kids that aren't receiving the farm. So maybe that's one way to kind of even the scales a little bit and make sure everybody gets some form of inheritance. Another option is to think about life, uh, life insurance. Life insurance can provide some extra liquidity, provide some extra funds to go out to those non-farm kids. Um, and as long as you're relatively young and healthy, term life insurance can be pretty cheap. Um, whole life or permanent insurance is a little bit more, but again, as long as you're relatively healthy, maybe it's not cost prohibitive. So to think about early price shopping to see how much is a life insurance in terms of premiums and if it's palatable, it's financially doable for you, maybe that's a good way to make sure, again, if one child is getting all the farm, maybe you'll have a life insurance policy that names the other non-farm kids as beneficiary to, again, ensure that they're also getting a piece of the pie. One thing, though, that I hear a lot though is again, that exact concern that, well, Johnny's getting the farm, we're getting nothing, how is this fair? Um, but think about what Johnny's probably thinking. It, I, I'm inheriting a farm, okay, I'm inheriting, you know, a couple, an eight, 100 plus or more acres of real estate and I'm inheriting this farm. But what that means is, you know, 18, 20 hour work days and uh, seven days a week. And maybe it's not producing a whole heck of a lot of income. And I, I'm gonna be working tooth and nail just to keep this thing afloat. Tell me how I got this big windfall, um, because maybe really it's not. So when considering the equity of things, maybe also recognizing that fact that even though one child receives the whole farm, on paper, it looks like they're getting a lot, but to that child, they're not really gonna recognize a you know, million dollars, even though that's what um, the paper says the real estate is worth, because they're not selling the real estate. And that's really the only way you recognize that. Um, so also keeping that in mind too, that Maybe even if one child is getting the whole farm and you have some other assets, maybe don't necessarily exclude the farm child just because it's really a big job that you're giving them and they may not see much fruits from their labor, again, depending on the profitability of the farm. So maybe they also are still a beneficiary on life insurance policies and other accounts. So again, just one other thing to make sure um, is factored into the decision-making process. Another big uh, problem that can arise is probate. If you still own these assets and say, well, I'm just going to hold on to the real estate and hold on the farm or everything until I die. And then again, that's when my will is going to come in or my trust is going to come in and say, these are the assets that are going to be distributed out to my beneficiaries. If all you have is just a will and you own those assets, again, solely in your name when you die, that means probate. So now the farm, the tractors, the land, all of that stuff is going to be tied up in a protracted probate administration process. Um, which could impact the ability of your beneficiaries to continue to operate and manage the farm. Um, and now you're involving executors and trustees and other folks who may not be the ones, you know, the, the farm child and maybe other people who are not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the farm. Um, so now you got other people kind of sticking their nose into the farm's business, so uh, which can create issues. So keep that in mind. Any assets that you own individually in your own name are going to have to go through that probate process. There are ways to avoid it. One is by having assets owned jointly. So if the assets are currently owned between you and your spouse, for example, those assets aren't going to have to pass through probate upon the first of you to pass just because joint assets pass automatically to the surviving call owner outside of probate. Um, but again, that could be an issue too. If you die first and all the assets go to your spouse, 
um, and then your spouse dies, now it's individually owned assets that are going to have to pass through their estate. So we're in the same kind of uh, situation. We've just kicked the can down the road a little bit. Um, also, a potential issue with that too is I've seen cases where husband and wife don't agree on what they want to see for the future of the farm. Uh, one spouse says, I really want it to go just to Johnny. The other spouse says, no, I think all the kids should be involved. Or I think even if they're not involved, they should get income. Um, or, you know, I think if we're both gone, it should just be sold. So that can be an issue too. If you say, well, I'm just going to leave it to my spouse. But if you ultimately, the spouses don't agree, again, on the overall disposition of the farm, you may have created further problems right there. So making sure if you're going to rely on joint ownership, at least for a time, making sure both spouses are on the same page in terms of what they want to happen to the farm. Also too, another way to avoid probate is to have assets owned in trust. So even if it is you own, you created LLCs and you own membership interest in the LLC, you can put those in trust to make sure those avoid probate. Or if you still own the real estate and the farm assets and everything directly in your own name, again, transferring those assets into a revocable trust will at the very least ensure that those assets don't have to go through probate and can, again, facilitate that process, make it a little bit easier for those uh, assets to transition over to the next generation. Uh, also, a really big concern, I know I say also a really big concern, I, I think I've said that a couple of times, but there's just so many important factors at play here. Um, and the next one that comes up a lot is long-term care. Um, farmers historically don't have 401ks and big IRAs and investment accounts. So if it gets to later in life and you need really substantial long-term care assistance. So if you have in-home, you need in-home caregivers, or if you should need to go into an assisted living facility or skilled nursing facility, those costs pile up pretty quickly. And if really the bulk of the assets that you own is the farm, that may mean that if you want to become eligible now for the state's Medicaid program, which will pay for your long-term care if you don't have the funds to, the only way you become eligible for that program is to essentially have no assets. To be eligible for Medicaid, and it, there's lots of um, very specific eligibility requirements I'm not gonna get into, but generally speaking, you can only have $1,600 worth of assets. So if you own hundreds of acres of real estate that's a million or 2 million plus on paper, you're not gonna be eligible for Medicaid and maybe put in the position of having now try, to try to sell those assets in order to get money to pay for your care and again, with an eye towards future Medicaid eligibility. So that may be one reason why when we're talking about farm succession and trans, uh, transitioning assets maybe to the next generation, it may be beneficial in some cases to start those transitions during your lifetime, not to wait until you've passed away and have it just distributed under a will or a trust. Um, because if you just keep holding on to those, say, I'm just going to hold it till I die, you may run into a whole host of problems. Now, again, if you have um, serious long-term care health care needs. Um, so another thing to keep in mind where you know there are some benefits for tax purposes and otherwise to holding on to certain assets until death, um, but it can mess things up for you and make a, a whole lot difficult more difficult to, to be eligible for Medicaid or to even pay for potential long-term care costs. Um, and last but not least, just something I always throw in, um, just because again, farmers tend to look really good on paper in terms of having lots of assets, just because lots of real estate it tends to be valued pretty highly. If you, again, if you own hundreds of acres of real estate, that could be millions of dollars in, on paper. Um, so for tax purposes, when you pass away, if you own millions of dollars in real estate, that may also mean you're paying potential estate taxes. So not too much of an issue right now, just because in Connecticut, um, in order for the estate tax to apply, you have to have at least $7 million in assets. And that's actually per person. So as a married couple, you can, if you maximize, add both of those exemptions together, the couple can have over $14 million worth of assets before the estate tax applies. Um, but there's also a federal estate tax, which right now is very generous. It's at $11.7 million, again, per person. Uh, but there are whispers at the federal level that they are going to potentially reduce that exemption back down to about five or six million. Um, so again, depending on the size of your real estate holdings, depending on the value of your business, it may put you over that threshold and put you in a situation, or I should say your estate and therefore your beneficiaries in the position of having to pay a tax after you pass away. If there's not a lot of liquid assets, again, this is a time where life insurance can play a really big role. Um, having a life insurance policy 
on you or your spouse, or maybe it's a second to die policy on both spouses that only pays out upon the second death can provide some much needed liquidity for payment of any potential taxes or probate fees or any funeral expenses, kind of those final bills that come up after you pass. So while I, I think estate taxes shouldn't be the primary reason uh, why you make a lot of decisions concerning your estate plan, um, it, it should definitely be factored in um, to the analysis of the overall plan, at least give some consideration to it. Um, and if it's not really an issue, then again, you don't have to center your entire plan around it, but definitely worth thinking about. So that's the information that I have today in terms of estate planning for farmers. I'd also like to note that um, myself and attorney Bill Dakin at our farm are also involved in a lot of really great organizations that are out there to assist farmers, uh, not, uh, nonprofit organizations to assist farmers with farm succession planning and farm estate planning matters. Um, or at least can facilitate some of that and get an initial plan in place before you have to come see an attorney. Um, so maybe able to help kind of set up a lot of that stuff in advance, or at least help you thinking about it, help connect you with professionals to assist you in that regard. Um, the big one being the Connecticut Farm Bureau is a wonderful organization. Um, there's also Land for Good, which is a really great organization up here in the Northeast, um, who actually just had a really wonderful training seminar uh, a two-day seminar that has a lot of information about farm viability and farm succession planning. So um, if you go onto Land for Goods website, a lot of those presentation materials are available as well. Um, so I'm going to give everybody a moment to see if we have any questions for today. Um, but again, as I'm uh, giving everybody a moment to maybe type some questions into the chat, again, please feel free um, to uh, contact us if you have any more specific questions about maybe something that I talked about in the webinar today. You can always go on our website, uh, kkc-law.com, to get um, our contact information or send us an email uh, with any questions that you might have or to schedule a time to speak with us directly, again, to review your specific situation. Also, too, we have a lot of great uh, webinars that we've already done. As I mentioned, I've had so much fun doing these already. Um, I've done a few in the past. They're all on our firm's website, or there's a link to our, our YouTube channel, I should say, on our website that has a lot of just general estate planning videos. So what are wills, what are trusts, what is probate? So if you're looking for also some just good basic estate planning information, you can visit our website for that as well and watch those videos. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up here in the chat. So I'm gonna end by saying thank you to everybody for logging on today. Um, again, please feel free to contact us with any questions or, or um, follow-up uh, webinars you'd like to see on maybe different topics. We always love to get feedback. Um, and then again, please stay tuned for two weeks from now, we're going to be having that webinar that I mentioned at the beginning about um, tax implications of receiving an inheritance. So please tune in in two weeks. And thank you guys all again for logging in today.